Welcome to the party. You found the Mouse Castle Lounge, the place to be for good times and great conversations from the world of Disney. The bar is open, your table is waiting, and drinks are now being served. Come on in. And now, here's your host, the keeper of the Mouse Castle Lounge, Tim Calloway. Welcome to the lounge. It's March 5th, 2016, and I'm Tim Calloway. We've got a really fun show for you today. My guest is film archivist for the Walt Disney Family Foundation, Scott Zone. Scott's had a successful career in the motion picture industry and has a fascinating connection to the golden age of Hollywood. But first, please follow The Mouse Castle everywhere we go by liking us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash The Mouse Castle. On Twitter, I am Disney Tim, and The Mouse Castle can also be found on Tumblr, Pinterest, and Instagram. Please share your comments and questions with us by emailing us at podcast at themousecastle.com, or you can call our listener line at 702-475-5MCL. That's 702-475-5625. And of course, you can always visit the blog at themousecastle.com, where you can can download the free Mouse Castle Lounge app for your mobile device. Just click the pic that says, get the app. I first learned about Scott Zone from a recent article in the Orange County Register detailing his 20-year association with the Walt Disney Family Foundation and the Disney family. Through Scott's work as a film archivist, he has restored and preserved 18 hours of home movies shot during Walt Disney's lifetime. That in itself is an interesting topic of conversation, but when I finally sat down to talk with Scott, I quickly learned that his Disney connection is just a small part of his successful career in the motion picture industry, a career that Scott began as a special effects cameraman on The Empire Strikes Back and Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Scott also has close ties to the golden age of Hollywood. His aunt, Burl Wallace, was the headline performer at the Earl Carroll Theater, a renowned supper club on Sunset Boulevard in the 1930s and 40s. It was a Hollywood landmark, with a 20-foot-high neon portrait of Burl proclaiming, Through these portals passed the most beautiful girls in the world. Scott and I met at the Offline Restaurant, not far from where the Earl Carroll Theater used to be. This converted craftsman-style home also has a connection to Burl Wallace and Earl Carroll, but I'll let Scott explain that story. It's Walt Disney, Star Wars, and Old Hollywood with my guest, Scott Zone, in the Mouse Castle Lounge. I'm in Hollywood at the historic Off Vine restaurant with my guest in the lounge today, Scott Zone. How are you doing today, Scott? Very good, thank you. This is an appropriate location for us to, to have our conversation today. The Off Vine restaurant has a very unique history that you're kind of tied to a little bit. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, the restaurant's located in a 1927 Craftsman home. And in this home, during the 1930s and 40s, my aunt and other members of my family actually lived in this house. Uh, my aunt was a performer. Uh, her name is Burl Wallace, and she was the star of Earl Carroll's review. Uh, Earl Carroll had a supper club here, right behind us, in fact, on Sunset Boulevard, the Earl Carroll Theater, and it was one of the very popular dinner theaters uh, of his time during that era in Hollywood where you had theaters such as the Earl Carroll Theater, Macombo, and others, and Earl Carroll was known for putting on big extravaganzas. He was an impresario. In fact, I think one of the monikers given to him was that he was the Ziegfeld of the West, and he would put on shows which featured large ensembles of dancers and musicians, and my aunt, Burl Wallace, was the star of the show. So Earl Carroll's theater originated in New York, but in 1938, he moved out here to Hollywood and opened up the Earl Carroll Theater on Christmas Day of 1938. And of course, my aunt came with him and came with the show and was very happy here. However, she found that she missed her family. Uh, she had a very large family back home in uh, Brooklyn, New York, Brighton Beach. She had eight brothers and sisters, and she also missed her mom as well. And so Earl Carroll bought this home, which is located right behind the theater, in order for Burl to move her family out here. And so Burl's mother and some of her brothers and sisters, one of her sisters being my mother, Millie, actually lived in this house. That is fascinating. And you, you showed me, if you look out the window here uh, at the building where Nickelodeon is now, that used to be the location of the Earl Carroll Theater, right? That is true. And 
Burl Wallace, uh, obviously she did a lot of performing live, but she was in a few movies too. What were some of the films that she <laughs> appeared in? Well, Burl was in uh, Murder at the Vanities, which was a 1934 pre-code Hollywood film. And she was in a string of B films, a lot of Westerns, Roy Rogers films. And she was also in uh, the movie Three Women, And beyond her movie work, she also had her own radio show, which was dedicated to the soldiers. Because keep in mind, this was during World War II, and she had a radio show called Furlough Fun, and all of the contestants, as well as the audience, were members of the armed services who were here uh, on furlough uh, in Hollywood at, at the time. And so between that and her work at the Earl Carroll Theater, Uh, She also had a television game show as well, one of the very first. And so her career was was somewhat varied and and, and broad. But of course, the real showpiece of her career and of her work was as a performer on the stage of the Earl Carroll Theater. You've showed me a lot of the memorabilia and photographs that decorate the Offbine restaurant that you did a lot of the restoration work on. And this kind of ties in to your career in the motion picture industry. And you are a man of many hats. You have been a photographer, a film archivist, uh, a colorist, and a special effects cameraman. And as a special effects cameraman, that kind of got my movie geek side going uh, because you worked on The Empire Strikes Back and Star Trek The Wrath of Khan. Tell me about what you did on those movies. Well, yes, I began my career in, in special effects. And I worked for a special effects facility. Um, They were called optical houses. And I worked for an optical house called Modern Film Effects. And some of the tasks that we had uh, in regard to The Empire Strikes Back was we did the effects for the lasers. If you recall, all those sabers, uh, all those lightsabers, those were all done optically. Uh, Of course, now they're done very differently in the digital age, but back then doing work like that, special effects for movies such as a lightsaber involved paper and pen and drawings and glue and uh, it was very physical and, um, uh, and that was the type of work we had done. In addition, we did more garden variety uh, type effects work like opticals and dissolves. For the uh, Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan, I worked on an animated uh, sequence which described how the Genesis device worked. You might recall the Genesis device was kind of the linchpin of that story. So we had done some animation uh, showing how, what the Genesis device was. And we also shot the titles and the credits and things like that. And again, in a pre-digital age, you were doing all these terrific effects. Uh, another pre-digital job that you did was that uh, as a colorist. And you were a colorist on a number of different movies. What does a colorist do? Well, think about home video and home movie rental and even just movies being broadcast on TV. Um, Of course, they originated on film. And the studios, in response to the home home video revolution, they wanted to make all these shows available for home rental, as well as television broadcast as well. So what a colorist does is takes the film, and looks at it up on a film scanner and actually goes through the entire movie one scene at a time adjusting the color making sure it flows making sure that it looks good and that it more or less works well and so in essence you're taking a show this on a a film medium and you're translating it to an electronic medium and making sure that in that transition that it's going to look as best as it possibly can. And the work that you've done as a colorist, as a a restorer of film and working on effects and things like that, has put you in a position to do a number of archival projects. And impressively, you have done a lot of work with the Disney family and the Walt Disney Family Museum. How did that start? Well, that happened while I was a colorist. And of course, most of the work you know, that I had done was movies and television shows. But then at one point, a project of a different nature came about. And it was probably my favorite project that I've ever worked on in my, in my entire career. And that was doing the restoration of Walt Disney's home movies. 
Now, when you say Walt Disney's home movies, how much material are we talking here? We're talking a, a lifetime of shooting uh, home movies. Indeed. Uh, the movies go as far back as 1933, and they continue throughout Walt Disney's life all the way until his passing in 1966. Where do you start when you have that much material? Uh, I mean, do you just start at the beginning? Were you looking for specific things at the behest of, of the family? How did, how did the project kind of evolve over time? Well, one thing that helped was the films were already pretty much laid out in chronological order uh, with a table of contents that, that described them. And so there were over 100 movies, but they were all numbered and they all had some form of identification on them. And so we took them in chronological order. So we just kind of, we got to watch the story um, as it unfolded. You are a self-described kind of a, a, a Disney history geek, like many of us are. And you've read a lot of the biographies, a lot of the histories out there about Disney and the Disney Studios. What was it like after reading all of that and knowing what you know to suddenly see to suddenly get a very personal insight into Walt Disney's life. You know, it was just it was just thrilling. Um, as you say, having already been, of course, a huge fan of Walt Disney and having read all the biographies that were out, what was really exciting was I'd be watching these home movies, and then now and again I'd actually see something within the home movies that represented a story or an anecdote that I'd heard about Walt Disney. For example, you know, we've all heard that on Saturdays that Walt would take his two daughters, Diane and Sharon, down to the studio with him. And that was, he called that Daddy's Day. And they would come down to the studio and they'd ride their bikes and they'd play. And so we we're looking at the home movies and then we come across a couple of roles, which is just that, is Walt Disney and his wife Lillian and his two daughters riding bikes at the studio. And that that happened many times throughout the project where you see something which is just a, com a complete visual representation of something you have heard, whether it be a legend or an anecdote, and now you're actually seeing it before you. And for me, that was just thrilling. And you worked closely with Diane Disney Miller during the whole process. What was she like to work with? That was a real thrill. There were many movies to go through, over 18 hours worth, over 100 films. And at the end, at the, uh, when I completed the project, uh, Diane came in and watched them with me. And so we watched them together, and Diane had, had not seen them in quite some time herself. And so she actually began narrating what we were watching. And so just to watch these films was so special and so exciting, let alone now to watch them with Diane Disney Miller sitting beside me actually narrating them. I think it was just the complete, most wonderful moment of my, of, of my career was probably that day. As these home movies have been restored, how are they then utilized by the Walt Disney Family Museum and the foundation? Well, um, years, years after the restoration, uh, the family opened the Walt Disney Family Museum up at the Presidio in San Francisco. And of course, they have wonderful artifacts that represent the Walt Disney's life. And of course, the home movies play a very important role in that. So when you go to the Walt Disney Family Museum, not only are you seeing you know, all the awards and, and all the special technology and all the things that you come to think of associated with Walt Disney, but you also get to see a lot of these home movies, which again makes it much more personal. And I would think that people um, who are visiting the museum when they see some of these home movies, you know, may have the very same reaction that I had, whereas they're actually seeing something that represents a story that they've long associated with Walt Disney. The, the footage has also found its way into different uh, documentaries and, and other special presentations. Where can we see some of that home movie, movie footage? Yes, there are a couple of movies out there that utilize this footage. Um, the first one was called Walt, Man Behind the Myth, and that's a film that's uh, available on, on DVD. And other films that have come along uh, that utilize this, most recently, um, just last fall, PBS aired a documentary for American Experience, that's their series, and it was called Walt Disney American Experience. And they utilize these films 
throughout the movie to help tell the story of Walt Disney's life. You talked about some of the watershed moments, like you know being able to see uh, Walt, uh, you know, take his daughters to you know to a carnival or to to the park, or the girls riding their bikes around the studio. I mean, those those are the ones that are kind of ingrained in you know the the collective uh, mindset of of Disney history buffs. What were some of your favorite, maybe? private moments and personal moments in in the films that perhaps not a lot of us know about? I think those would be the films that show Walt Disney as father, as family man, because when you think of someone as iconic as Walt Disney, you don't tend to think of him or a person like that, you know, in that way. And to see footage of Walt Disney, you know, just in the swimming pool, playing with his daughters and just doing regular daddy things, it just brings uh, an element to it that you don't ordinarily get to see, and it was very lovely. Now, this is just you know one big project that you're working on, and you have kind of built a business around doing restoration work on more personal film footage and such. Talk about your business a little bit. Well, yes, I'm doing that now, which is really an offshoot from the work I've done all these years for the Disney family. I came to realize that this type of work, you know, restoration and archiving of a family's history is something that would be of value not only to the Disney family, but really to many families. So now I'm taking the work that I've done and I'm applying it to my own business where I'm offering this work, which is restoration and archiving, to really any family that wants to really preserve their their legacy. And these days, I guess I would call it preserving their digital legacy. And now I'm also offering this service to entertainers because I think everybody has a story to tell. And when you think of entertainers, you know, the things that they acquire over their lifetime, you know, the awards, all the bits of memorabilia, I would think that entertainers have a special need for it as well. So this really is an offshoot from what I have done for the Disney family all these years because now I realize really everybody has a story to tell and I'm happy to, I'm happy to be there to help with the restoration, preservation, and archiving of their story. What's the process that you would go to to preserve or, or restore, you know, say an eight millimeter, 16 millimeter uh, home movie? I mean, it's, you don't just transfer it over to digital. Uh, go a little bit more into detail about how you make that work. Well, you know, every, every family has different elements, and um, they can consist of photographs, slides, movies, audio tapes, and of course, all of this media has a very finite shelf life. So primarily, you're concerned with transferring this material to something that you can archive over time, and at the same time, you want to preserve the original element as well. So for example, if I am preserving a home movie, the process would be scanning that movie and making a digital file out of it. Now, it could be, it's very likely that over time that movie could have faded and the color has not retained the original luster that it, that it once had. So once I've created digital files, I'll go through that material and I will work with the color and fix the, fix the areas that have faded or discolored and try to bring them back as best as possible to their you know, original pristine condition. And once I'm through with the film, I want to make sure that although we're done taking our material from that film, we still want that piece of film to be around for a long, long time as well. So I work with people and I show them how to properly archive all their old material so it will be around for the future as well. Not only the new digitized version, but even the originals as well. And so I work with different facilities in Hollywood that specialize in long-term storage of video and film material. So now that you have your material digitized, whether it be a movie or an audio tape or a photograph, you want to make sure that now that that's going to be around for a long, long time as well, because what most people don't realize is that the material in the digital world also, even more so than the originals, has a very finite life. So you want that to be around for generations to come as well. And so there are ways, there are certain practices that you utilize to make sure that the material will be. Um, One of those practices would be called data migration, and that is, let's say you've saved your material to a hard drive. Once it's there, 
you don't want to, as we say, store it and ignore it. You really want to maintain it over time, just as you're maintaining the original elements, such as the film, over time. So with certain practices, such as data migration, where every couple of years you would move the material from an existing hard drive to another one, you're ensuring the long-term archival you know, value of the material. And when you're making a digital copy or you're preserving the digital copy, what do you do to address the fact that technology is going to continue to change and the format and how it's digitized now is going to continue, you're going to be able to continue to use it in the future? You know, you make a good point, Tim, because I find that I'm always chasing technology, even within film transfer itself. For example, the first time that we did a a restoration of Walt Disney's home movies, the tape format was analog. And since then, of course, technology changed. It went from analog, it changed to digital. And after that, it changed again to high definition. And so, you know, we find that we're, we're chasing a moving target with technology. And that's why it's really... Um, I consider myself a a real steward uh, of the material because I don't consider the preservation work a one-shot deal. It really does require maintenance. And for example, with Walt Disney's home movies, um, the film is excellently stored in refrigerated storage. However, every year I do a physical inspection of that. And so whether you're working with your old original material or your new digitized material, you really have to be a steward of that material and think of it as a, as a long-term conservation project. And if people want to find out more about Scott Zone and the work that you do, uh, where can they find that out online? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, I, you know I was going to get to that eventually. <laughs> Certainly. Um, my work, uh, my company is called Scott Zone Legacy Archiving, and you can simply Google my name, Scott Zone, and you will find me there. The um, umbrella title of my company is Scott Zone Media. And if you Google Scott Zone, Scott Zone Media, it will take you to my website, which really kind of breaks down the different elements involved in restoration and archiving. And it also has a, uh, a contact page on there. If anybody would like to reach me directly, they can reach me and I'd be more than happy to assist with people that would like to utilize my services. Well, Scott, thank you very much for the work that you've done to preserve the home movies of the Walt Disney family uh, for the museum and for fans everywhere. And thank you also for uh, being there to preserve the memories of, of those of us who aren't Walt Disney. It has been absolutely my pleasure to have you today in the Mouse Castle Lounge. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you for having me, Tim. It's been a pleasure. Back with another edition of Adventures Through Liquid Space. You know, we really got to get you like a cool jingle or something like that. Um, I, Carolyn is here. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hello, everyone. We are going to get you a jingle or maybe we'll just get somebody who sounds like Paul Freeze that can do the voice. Yes. And, and I want uh, business cards and stationery. I'll, I'll and get like on it. I'll have, I'll have my people get with your people. Okay. <laughs> And I'm stealing this from you because you said it earlier. Rather than magnification, we'll go with... Intoxication. Oh, I like that. Intoxication. Intoxication. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So (laughs) so anyway, for today's tasty beverage, we kind of have a theme going along here. Uh, Scott Zone was my guest, of course, in the Mouse Castle Lounge that everybody Mm -hmm. just heard. And as fascinating as his story was about the work that he's done doing film preservation with the Walt Disney Family Museum, I was really, really just fascinated by the fact that his aunt had this connection to old Hollywood and the Earl Carroll Theater Mm -hmm. and just this great era, you know, in Hollywood. And so I asked Carolyn if she could come up with a classic cocktail that was worthy of that era. Yeah, and Earl Carroll's theater, uh, it wasn't just theater, it was also a supper club. Um, so they had uh, dinner and drinks that you could uh, uh, enjoy. And I just went on the internet and actually found... Um, cat videos. Co- oh, no, sorry. Well, okay, it was after the cat videos. <laughs> but uh, I, <laughs> uh, I found a menu from the, the supper club and... Um, you know, just, it, it's always so much fun to look at old menus, just, you know, what was served 
uh, I think uh, coffee was what twenty five cents, but Sanka was thirty five cents. Oh my goodness! Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a big deal. Well, I mean, I saw some of the cocktails on there were like fifty cents. I know. Uh, and I think for very expensive champagne, it was like a buck twenty five, and that's really high living. Yeah, and a French seventy five was a dollar. So I think anything that had the champagne in it got got the upcharge. But you know, we decided on uh, one of the cocktails that was actually on the menu. And it's the Pink Lady, which really is appropriate because the Earl Carroll Theater was known for for having the most, you know, beautiful women performing there. And um, we decided on the Pink Lady, and then you found out it was a gin drink. I'm glad though. And that... I said, do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you said that because it it was uh, it was a fun drink to make and um, a fun drink to drink. Not so much fun the day after, but uh, <laughs> I think I think. I think even you'll enjoy it. So first thing that I did, there are a lot of different recipes for a pink lady, but um, I have a a classic cocktail book by David Embry, and he's kind of seen as a respected member of the cocktail. uh, um, Cognizante. Okay. Yeah, that (laughs) sounds good. Uh, The book is from 1948, so he was making the cocktails right, you know, in the right, right around the that time, because time. Uh, yeah. the Earl Carroll Theater would have been popular in the late 30s, early 40s, mm-hmm. so that works. Yeah, so I trust the uh, the recipe that he put in his book. And so the Pink Lady is it's it's one part grenadine, two parts lemon or lime juice, two parts of apple brandy, six parts gin, and then when you're making two drinks, you add an egg white. Now, why would you add the egg white if you're making multiple drinks? You wouldn't add it if you're just making the one? I think, and this is just my guess, um, I think because just amount, you know, because they were cracking eggs back in the day and then using the egg white from a single egg. So one egg is good to for two drinks. But I actually just bought a carton of liquid, liquid uh, egg whites they're, they're pasteurized, so you don't have to worry about, you know, any sort of terrible disease or, or gastrointestinal distress. Well, that's um, good to know. <laughs> yeah. And I can just measure out a good amount of egg white for making even just one drink. So uh, so that's why I think that for two drinks, they'll say, OK, you can use an egg white just because of the amount of egg white, because you don't want too much egg white in your drink. No. And I, I mean, that just kind of gives a kind of a frothy yeah, exactly. Texture, right? It, it gives the drink uh, a creaminess that isn't heavy like actually using cream. So it just, it, you get a nice little froth on it and, you know, just a really nice mouthfeel and you don't taste it. So you don't have to, you know, I think people would be kind of grossed out that you're going to taste egg in your, in your drink. But no, you don't. Uh, if you use too much, you'll get that smell. But uh, like I said, now that we have the the wonderful little carton of egg whites at the at the grocery store. You can measure out exactly how much you need. So um, I think a tablespoon of liquid egg whites for one drink is just fine. Okay. So David Embry liked his drinks very strong and not sweet at all. All through his book, his proportions make for like I said, stiff drinks. So when you take parts and make them actual. Uh, measurements. Uh, he's just saying use quarter ounce of grenadine, half an ounce of juice, then half an ounce of apple brandy, and then one and a half ounces of gin. I upped the grenadine just to give it a little more sweetness because it can be pretty tart. So um, I think just a little more grenadine makes for really a fantastic drink. Now there are also some recipes that call for equal parts apple brandy and gin. And if you're thinking about apple brandy uh, and you go, you, you want to go to your local Total Wine or BevMo, Laird's Applejack is probably the way to go. And that's what I used. There are recipes that call for equal parts, Applejack and gin. And I would actually suggest that for you. Both ways, having a gin heavy or having equal parts, they're both great drinks. They're It's more of a personal preference then. Uh, yeah, exactly. The Applejack, uh, if you up the Applejack, it does make for actually a smoother drink that makes it a lot easier to drink, which could get you in trouble because you could you could really suck them down. It just it's just so easy drinking. 
as you found out the morning after you tried this uh, experiment. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there was a lot of experimentation because I did. I tried the different proportions. I also, you know, lemon juice versus lime juice. And it, in my house, it was unanimous that lemon juice is really the, the way to go. And then it was, you know, testing how much grenadine to put in. Uh, yeah, so it was a little painful the following day. <laughs> but in the I, end, I, it was well worth the sacrifice. It was all worth it. So I think that the magic, the magic recipe uh, will be, like I said, half ounce of grenadine, half ounce lemon juice, and then you can either do three-quarter ounce Applejack to three-quarter ounce gin or just half an ounce of Applejack to one and a half ounces of gin. A tablespoon of liquid egg whites. Now, here's something I got to tell you. When you are making drinks with egg whites, you have to shake the living daylights out of it. You have to, to shake that shaker until your arms hurt. You have to shake it until you break a sweat. Um, and why is to... that? Other than I'm forming this visual in my head of, of you going crazy with a cocktail shaker. Yeah, red, red faced and, and <laughs> shaking like the shake weight. Veins popping out in the side of your neck, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you, you want to get that froth. And I think there is some kind of magic chemistry involved where you're, you're breaking up the egg whites to, to get that frothiness. But um, everyone agrees that you have to, to really give it a good shake. You will not be disappointed. It's it's well worth it because it, it does add to the drink. I mean, it's, it'll be a perfectly good drink without it, but... It'll give it that little extra... Oof. Yeah, expand your horizons. It's worth the weirdness. Ah, <laughs> you know, and that's really what the Mouse Castle Lounge is all about. That, may be, <laughs> that might be our, our new motto. It's worth the weirdness. It's weird, yeah, yeah. Oh, and one other thing. Grenadine. Get real grenadine. Do not use rose as grenadine because... Uh, Rose's grenadine. That's just cherry syrup. Yeah, compared to real grenadine, it's like comparing real fruit juice to Kool Aid. One is the real thing, and one is just all artificial flavoring. And you don't. Rose's grenadine doesn't have that pomegranate flavor that you're supposed to that you're supposed to get. And there's supposed to be a little tartness too. Um, it's not just supposed to be you know high fructose corn syrup and red food coloring. Just look at the ingredient label. It should be pomegranate juice you know, some, maybe some sugar and citric acid or whatever, but there shouldn't be any, like I said, high fructose corn syrup or artificial coloring. Total Wine has small batch pomegranate syrup, so you'll be able to find it no problem. It's it's readily available at, you know, your local, I don't want to say liquor store, but Your local box. beverage establishment. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> BevMo will have it too. All right. So there you go. There's the Pink Lady, a great cocktail from a a glamorous time. Cheers. Hey, cheers. And that will do it for this edition of the Mouse Castle Lounge. Thank you to Scott Zone for being my guest. A big thank you also to the fine people at the Off Fine Restaurant for their hospitality. Stay up to date with everything going on in the Mouse Castle Lounge. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. You can also download the free Mouse Castle Lounge app, which you can get right now by going to themousecastle.com and clicking Get the App. Anthony Reynolds and I host Inside the Mouse Castle with your weekly dose of Disney news, information, and commentary. Do give us a listen. The Mouse Castle Lounge is not affiliated with the Walt Disney Company. I just like to talk about them. I'm Tim Calloway. It's been a blast as always, so let's do this again real soon. Take care. Take care.